recording button. Yeah, it is getting recorded now. And maybe I make co-host to a few of my colleagues. Okay. Let me do a full screen. Yeah. So I am just waiting for Pronoun. Uh, maybe Pronoun will join soon. Yeah. So is it uh, one hour, 15 minutes? What is the... Uh, normally it is uh, one hour. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But if you want a few more minutes, uh, I mean, it's perfectly okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I should uh, be done. Yeah. Let's see. So, okay, so welcome everyone to this uh, Friday Mathematics Colloquium uh, after quite some time. So it is a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Onis Ghosh from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Uh, as you have seen in the uh, abstract circulation that Professor Anis Ghosh is, an, uh, is a faculty member at the School of Mathematics, DIFR Mumbai. Uh, he is also a faculty at the Infosys Chandrasekharan Random Geometry Center at the Tata Institute. Uh, he has several awards. Uh, and acc accolades uh, in his uh, uh, curriculum vitae that includes uh, BM Birla Prize in 2017, uh, Nasi Skopu's Young Scientist Award in the same year, along with uh, DST Sharna Joyanti Fellowship. And just, I think a month back, or uh, yeah, I, I think just a month back, uh, Dr. Onis Ghosh has been the recipient of this year's Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award. So heartiest congratulations on this for the award and very, we are thankful that you have uh, come here to give this colloquium talk just after receiving the award. So I would now uh, over it to you to uh, speak about the topic, which is, is root two very different from Q root of two. Thank you. So Anish, over to you. Uh, you are muted. Unmute yourself. All right. Uh, okay. Is it okay now? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. It's perfect. Perfect. All right. Okay. So I'd like to thank uh, Krishnendu and the organizers for this very kind invitation. Um, I uh, visited Mohali only once during the, I think it was a Ramanujan Math Society meeting, but it was a really enjoyable trip and I'd be very happy to come back at some point. But uh, till that transpires, I'm really uh, thankful for this invitation and happy to uh, talk to you online. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, try to give you some feeling for the kind of mathematics that I do. And so uh, that's my main goal today, right? So I'm going to start with some uh, problems which, uh, you know, are very easy to state and kind of very difficult to uh, approach. And then in the grand old tradition of uh, mathematics, uh, we'll try to, uh, try the hard problem and then fail and then try to do a slightly easier problem, which is hopefully still interesting. Okay, so that's the goal today. Um, please feel free to uh, interrupt with any questions, right? So this is basically just a story about what I do. There's no uh, end goal or anything. So don't, don't worry about interrupting me. I'll be very happy to take interruptions. I can't see, uh, the chat. So if 
one of the organizers could uh, alert me if there are questions in the chat, I'd be very happy. All right, so uh, that's the uh, preamble to the talk. Now, um, what is it that I do? So I am uh, what one calls an ergodic theorist, right? So ergodic theory uh, started off as a subject uh, in uh, physics, in statistical mechanics, right? So the Austrian uh, physicist, the great Austrian physicist, uh, Ludwig Boltzmann, uh, is, uh, can be said to be one of the one of the people who started this subject. And what it has to do is it tries to somehow predict um, the behavior of very complex systems. Right? So the stereotypical example is a gas molecule. Okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, you have a gas molecule stay inside a room and you want to try to model its behavior. So now this, the problem with this kind of thing is, uh, you know, in principle, of course, we should be able to do this, right? We should be able to write down some nice equations and then work them out and predict what happens to one, you know, but this, the motion is highly chaotic. So very sensitive to initial conditions, very sensitive. And so this kind of behavior, it turns out to be very difficult to model. And if we have other examples of this kind of behavior, and all of us, especially in Mumbai where I am, you know, we keep a very keen watch on the weather prediction. Should I take an umbrella or should I not? Right? Am I going to regret uh, this or not? And uh, even though we are very good, uh, uh, very good, uh, made a lot of scientific advances, uh, in meteorology, we still somehow see that there is uh, always, uh, it's not always very accurate. So it's, it's a complex system, what to do. So the ergodic theory approach to this is to try to uh, say that, okay, let's try to predict long-term behavior. Right? So we don't know anything much about this, uh, the, you know, the short-term behavior of a highly chaotic uh, system, but maybe we can say something about long term. And this led to what Boltzmann and others, uh, Ehrenfest and Ehrenfest, for example, called uh, the ergodic hypothesis. Right? So, and what it says is that if you have some uh, chaotic uh, uh, dynamical system, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by dynamical system shortly then uh, if things are chaotic, they can still be well-behaved in the sense that when you average over the trajectory of this chaotic particle over long times, right? So you take a long average over the trajectory, uh, perhaps the particle is nice enough to visit all parts of the phase space roughly equal, right? So what it means is that longer and longer averages of the orbit of the particle uh, fill up the space. So in mathematical terms, if I take a nice function, you know, and sample the orbit at very long durations, then as in the limit as the size of the orbit goes to infinity, I end up with just the integral of the function over the space, all right? So this is uh, what is called an ergodic theorem. And uh, this two versions of it, one for uh, in L2 and one in L1, were proved around the same time by uh, Birkhoff and von Neumann. And uh, this is a, a beautiful theorem. So it says that on one hand, on the left-hand side, you have a highly uh, complicated system and you're trying to integrate some function over a very complicated orbit. On the right-hand side, it's just an integral over some space, all right? So in principle, it's much easier to evaluate, okay? So this is what an ergodic theorem is. This is what ergodic theory tries to do for various uh, systems of this kind. And now the main question is, so what has that got to do with the title of my talk? Right? And uh, as you can see, it has to, it says, 
what is the difference between the square root of two and the cube root of two, okay? So the story that I want to present today is how one can use ergodic theory to try to study a, a question which uh, a priori has absolutely nothing to do with it, all right? That's what I'm going to try to uh, explain today. So let's start with some number theory with uh, which we're all more or less familiar. Uh, and that is the beautiful theory of continued fractions. Right? So uh, even now, if you uh, catch hold of a person in the street and say, well, do you know what pi is? They're likely to say that it's equal to 22 by seven. And this is because from our school days, we've learned that 22 over seven is a good approximation for pi. And in fact, uh, it turns out as we know, uh, you can write every real number in terms of a continued fraction expansion. Right? So for example, number pi has a continued fraction expansion, which looks like this. And what this symbol means is just shorthand for the fact that you can write pi in this form. So, it's, so you can write uh, pi as three plus one over one, seven plus one over 15 and so on and so forth. And this is some kind of infinite uh, sum, okay? So this notation is shorthand for this uh, continued fraction expansion. And we know that uh, you know, if a number is rational, then this continued fraction expansion is going to terminate and so on and so forth. And in general, a lot of, um, you can learn a lot about a number and how complicated the number is by studying its continued fraction expansion. So it's a beautiful uh, tool and has been used uh, extensively to try to understand properties of numbers. Okay? So the entries in the continued fraction expansion are called partial quotients. And of course, one can read off rational approximations for, your, for the number of your choice by looking at truncations of the continued fraction expansion. So here's one. And here is the continued fraction expansion of the square root of two. Right? So it's just one followed by twos, okay? So this, uh, the continued fraction expansion of the square root of two uh, is, uh, provides an example, uh, an instance of a uh, theorem of Lagrange, which says that a uh, number is a quadratic irrational if and only if its continued fraction expansion is eventually periodic, okay? So that's a characterization of being a quadratic irrational, all right? So another thing to notice about the square root of two uh, is that uh, if you look at, uh, let me just go back to the last slide, if you look at the continued fraction expansion of pi, they're kind of, uh, it's kind of irregular, right? So there's a three, seven, 15, one, and there's a jump, there's a 292 and so forth. So there are jumps in it, whereas in the case of the square root of two, it's just uh, uniform. In particular, the entries in the continued fraction expansion of the square root of two are bounded, right? There's a uniform bound for the entries in the square root, in the continued fraction expansion of the square root of two, all right? So uh, this brings me to uh, another uh, way of understanding uh, real numbers or rational numbers, which is, uh, getting better and better rational approximations. So another way of getting very good rational approximations closely connected to continued fractions is what is called the pigeonhole principle. Okay, so this is uh, the theorem of Dirichlet, And it says that uh, for every real number X, you can find a good rational approximation to it in the following sense. So you can essentially, you, you can find a rational number P over Q such that the difference between X and P over Q 
is at most one over Q squared, where Q is a denominator. Okay. So uh, what I've written here is uh, is actually the pigeonhole principle. And the corollary of it, which is what I'm uh, saying out loud, is that every real number admits infinitely many rational approximations, P over Q, with the difference between X and P over Q bounded by one over Q squared. All right, so this is a good approximation to your number and the goodness of the approximation is measured by the denominator of the rational, which is a good indication of the complexity of the rational. All right, so this is what Dirichlet's theorem says, and uh, we've all encountered this before. You've seen uh, you've seen these uh, pigeon holes, and you'll notice that since there are more pigeons than holes, one hole has uh, more than one pigeon. Right, so that's the top left one over here. And that's how the proof of this theorem goes, okay? So in other words, so uh, this is just a sketch of, sketch of the proof. So you can chop up uh, 0, 1 into uh, n plus 1 parts. There are n plus 1 such numbers. And uh, so there are n plus 1 numbers. And you chop, it, chop 0, 1 into n intervals of length 1 over n. And therefore, one of the sub-intervals must contain uh, two of these numbers whose difference is at most one over n. Okay, so that's just a, a simple uh, fact. It's a simple fact which, uh, because it's so simple, is very robust. So this uh, theorem, as well as this simple proof, uh, carries over in very general contexts, like in higher dimensions and so on and so forth. All right. So this is something which is going to become important later because uh, one of the great stumbling blocks of understanding uh, number theory in high dimensions is the lack of a suitable Cadier fraction expansion. I'll come to that later. All right, so that's what uh, Derek's theorem says. So now going back to uh, Derek's theorem, it says, uh, can you see my uh, mouse pointer? Yeah. Okay. So greatly same remember said that there are infinitely many solutions to alpha minus p over q less than or equal to one over q squared. All right. It turns out that there are numbers which admit the opposite inequality as well, as long as you replace one by a smaller constant depending on the number. These numbers are called badly approximable numbers, and they satisfy this reverse inequality for all P and Q, for all rationals P and Q. Okay, so what's an example of such a number? An example of such a number is our uh, old friend, the square root of two from two slides ago, okay? So remember I told you that the square root of two uh, is a quadratic irrational and has an eventually periodic Cartier fraction expansion it also has a property that the entries in the Cartier track expansion are bounded. And it turns out that this is, uh, characterizes the property of being a badly approximable number. So namely, a number is badly approximable by rational numbers, if and only if it has bounded partial quotients. All right. So, uh, this is a very satisfactory uh, characterization of value approximate numbers. And uh, one can ask how many such numbers there are. And it turns out that there are not so many if you look uh, at the real line in terms of uh, measure, all right? But if you open your, um, tennis, your microscope and zoom in a little, you will find that at the right scale, there are actually lots of them. Namely, they have house of dimension one. So it looks like there aren't any, but that's because you're not looking at the right scale. Once you zoom in and look at the right scale, there are lots of these guys, okay? And they play an important role in various uh, parts of mathematics as well as uh, physics. For example, badly approximable numbers have a special role 
in studying uh, planetary orbits, all right? So this has to do with a subject called the KAM theory, where they have a special significance. I just, um, just uh, putting it out there in case you're interested, you can look it up. I won't have much to say about it today. All right, today we're interested in, uh, all right, so the square root of two is badly approximate, very good. Now, uh, what can you say about the cube root of two? Is it, for example, badly approximate? And, uh, you know, two uh, are great collective embarrassment. It turns out that uh, nobody knows whether any algebraic number of degree greater than two is badly approximate. All right, absolutely no idea. Okay, so this is one of these things which uh, are, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure they're, they abound in many parts of, uh, in, in essentially all of mathematics, but especially in the kind of things that I do, there's a, a great surplus of very simple sounding questions which have absolutely no answers. And it's uh, really, uh, you know, I find it both uh, intimidating as well as beautiful that this, this uh, phenomenon seems to be. So for example, this question, it's uh, just unknown, right? So what I want to try to explain today is how one might go about trying to prove such a conjecture. The bad news is that I can't prove it, but uh, along the way, we'll try to prove uh, some other interesting stuff. All right, so uh, I think it's a good place to stop and ask, uh, are there any questions? Someone can you, is, yes, please ask. Can you repeat the um, definition of badly approximate numbers? Certainly, by, uh, of course. So it's here on this slide. Uh, it says that, uh, so let me remind you that every alpha admits uh, infinitely many p over q says that alpha minus p over q is less than or equal to one over q squared. Okay, a badly approximable number is a number which satisfies this inequality written over here, alpha minus p over q is at least a constant depending on alpha divided by q squared for all p over q, okay? So it satisfies the reverse inequality with one and this uh, at least inequality with some number smaller than one. Is that clear? Yeah. yeah, okay. All right. Anything else I can answer? Um, can you explain what a Lebesgue measure is? Okay, uh, that's a very good question. So uh, I think I'm going to take the easy way out by saying that uh, it won't play a big role in the talk. So that's, that's actually a terrible lie because ergodic theory has a lot to do with measure. But let me try to uh, kind of give you an explanation in terms of this uh, microscope that I have, right? So, uh, you know, you have, uh, you can see a lot of things, right? And they're visible to you, but there are lots of things that do exist which you can't see but they do become visible to you when you get yourself uh, an, a nice microscope and focus, all right? Similarly, there's, there are lots of subsets of the line, right? Which uh, are not big enough to be seen as such. So we've developed, you know, mathematicians have developed a notion of length and area and volume. And a good way of uh, building such a theory is, is by using something called Lebesgue measure. This is a kind of uh, instrument which gives a sensible answer to the question, what is the size of the subset of the real line? So if you ask it, uh, hey, Lebesgue measure, what's the subset or what's the length of the interval zero one? It's going to say one. 
if you ask it what's the length of the interval 0 2 it will say 2 okay but it's also uh, powerful enough to uh, you know you can ask it the length of other subsets of the line okay so for example you can ask it uh, uh, hey level measure what's the sub length of the canter set and it'll say the canter set has length zero right that's what it will say and this makes sense but we know that the canter set is uncountable okay so then we have as uh, mathematicians we had to develop a more meaningful theory which takes into account the fact that there are uncountable subsets of the real line and we have to learn to distinguish between them and one object which came up is this uh, notion of dimension all right so the real line uh, we have all learned as dimension one, the plane has dimension two, space has three dimensions, space time has four dimensions. Beyond that, nobody knows what's going on. But it's possible uh, rigorously to develop the notion of subsets of the line of the plane having dimensions which are not um, integers. Okay. And this theory helps us distinguish between sets which really are different in terms of size but which are not different enough that Lebesgue measure which is a very powerful but sometimes a coarse tool can distinguish so the Cantor set which has zero Lebesgue measure that's one example uh, the rationals the set of rationals also has zero Lebesgue measure but one of them is countable the other is not Right? So that doesn't sound right. We should have a way of distinguishing between them. And one of these ways is to develop the notion of Hausdorff dimension. So the Cantor set uh, can be, it can, you can make a meaningful uh, mathematical statement that the Cantor set has dimension, uh, the standard Cantor set has dimension log two by log three. All right, so it's a number, it's not an integer, it's a number which signifies the size of the Cantor set. And in terms of this size, the badly approximable numbers, they form a set which has zero Lebesgue measure, is uncountable, and yet it's plentiful because its house of dimension is the maximum possible, it's one. So in some sense, there are very few of these. In another sense, there are very, very many of these. It's like, you know, these horror stories that one reads about, about how many germs on your keyboard, right? So I look at my keyboard and I say zero germs. <laughs> I can't see it. But then the right person has a look at it with the right instrument and there'll be a full house of dimension worth of germs on your keyboard, right? This is something like that. Does it make sense? Yes, yes, I, I, I understood. All right. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, it's, it, it's, it'll take me too long to kind of flesh out the technical details of the measure and it'll take me too far from the talk. But um, a good place to, I mean, the place I read about this is in uh, Rodin's book, you know, the Mama Rodin. And uh, it, it worked for me, and, and, and hopefully it will work for you as well. But you know, there are probably many better books now. All right. Uh, anything else I can answer? Okay. So uh, this is where we find ourselves. We find ourselves in the uncomfortable situation of not knowing very much about the cube root of two. So how does one rectify this embarrassment? So that's what we're going to try to study over the next half hour or so, all right? So now that we've had a good discussion for about uh, measure, and thank you for the question actually, it really helped me uh, 
it helps me to kind of uh, move to the next slide. Now that we have a good, uh, we have some uh, discussion about the measure, let me uh, present to you a beautiful theorem due to the Russian mathematician Kinchin, which says uh, that, uh, okay, it's very hard to pinpoint uh, good arithmetic properties of uh, numbers, specific numbers like pi or cube root of two or whatever. But if you're happy to understand the number theoretic properties of a sufficiently large subset of real numbers, then you can actually do this. Right? So basically, uh, what sufficiently large means in this bullet point where it says for almost every x, it means that for all numbers x in a set of full Lebesgue measure, okay? That's what it means. Means that in terms of Lebesgue measure, this is a full set, right? So for almost every x in this set, in, in the, for every x in a set of full Lebesgue measure, there exists infinitely many p over q rational numbers, such that you can approximate x by p over q with an accuracy determined by some function psi, if and only if a simple uh, sum, which is a simple condition which involves the sum of this function psi can be checked. Namely, this uh, real number, so this inequality x plus p over q less than psi of q can be solved infinitely often if this uh, sum converges and it admits at most finitely many solutions if this sum converges, okay? So this is a beautiful theorem of Kinchin uh, from the 1920s uh, proved using continued fractions. There's a gem of a book uh, due to Kinchin, written by Kinchin called Continued Fractions. It's in the Dover series. It's a lovely book. It's worth taking along on a long train ride or something. Very entertaining, uh, beautiful mathematics. One thing I have to say at this point is that as I've stated on this slide, this theorem is false, right? So it's a very important thing that Kinchin uh, insisted that this function psi here be uh, somehow monotonically decreasing. Okay? So it should be, so in Dirichlet's theorem, this function psi takes the role one over Q, which is a decreasing function. And Kinchin proved his theorem for um, decreasing functions. Right? So that's an important caveat. It should have been in the statement, in the hypothesis. But what's very exciting is last year, this is the year 2021, yes. So in the year 2019, uh, two mathematicians, uh, James Maynard and uh, Dimitri Kokolulopoulos, they proved an outstanding conjecture due to Duffin and Schaefer, which removed this monotonicity condition from the hypothesis of Kinchin's theorem. It's really a very, uh, it was a sensation when it was proved, a beautiful piece of work. Um, and uh, I just wanted to put that, mention that over here. Okay, so this is Kinchin's theorem. Uh, it follows from a lemma in probability called the Burel Cantelli lemma, which I am going to skip because it's uh, kind of technical and not very helpful. All right, so let's ignore this slide. Uh, yeah, excuse me. Um, yes, yes. In the last slide, I think you said like the sum converges. One second, right? let me go back. Is it? Uh, yes. Yeah, you said like the sum converges, but in the slide it says it's equal to infinity. Oh, I see. I so I, uh, so th this is uh, typically the case, which is to say that uh, I was, I said something uh, I didn't mean to. So let me re uh, say this again, all right? So uh, let's uh, call, name a set, right? So let's name a set. 
let's call it, this set depends on this function psi. Let's call it A of psi, okay? And A of psi comprises those real numbers, x, which admit infinitely many rational solutions to this inequality, okay? So this is a set A of psi. And the theorem says that if psi decreases monotonically, then E of psi has full Lebesgue measure if this sum diverges and has zero Lebesgue measure if it converges. Does that make sense? There are two uh, outcomes to the theorem uh, had consists of the theorem is about a set, this set A of psi. And there are two possible outcomes to the size of A of psi. Okay. Either it's very big or it has size zero. The very big happens exactly when this sum depending only on psi diverges and the zero happens when it converges. So for example, two slides ago, we saw Dirichlet's theorem, right? It said that every real number admits a solution x minus p over q less than one over q squared, right? So if I write it in this form where I multiply through by q, I get a one over q here. And as we all know, the harmonic series diverges, right? So that's just a, a check. So, so this is what it, what it is. It generalizes Dirichlet's theorem. Dirichlet's theorem gives you all approximations to all real numbers by one over denominator squared. This says that, okay, you can replace one over denominator squared by something more complicated, like one over Q log log Q, all right? That's fine. You can do whatever you like. All you need to worry about is what happens when you sum this function, okay? Is it clear, the statement? Uh, yeah, I think, yes. Uh, all right. Thank you for the question. Anything else? So what you just uh, said about Kinchin's theorem, that sounds something like Kolmogorov zero one law because you're- That's talking. right, exactly. Absolutely, right? It's a zero one law in quantum theory. Very good, well spotted. It's, it's an example of a zero one law, exactly. This is what actually my next slide was about, but I think uh, I don't want to spend time on uh, explaining zero one law, so I'm just going to let it skip. But if you like, we can discuss it in the question and answer. Is that okay? Should I proceed? Um, yes, sir. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is Kenjin here, and uh, just uh, another small plug for this uh, sensational work of Maynard and uh, Kokolopoulos, which you can look up. I think there was a Quanta magazine article on it, and so on and so forth. Anyway, so. Uh, Right, so this is all great, right? So we started off with continued fraction expansions and found that they tell us a lot about properties of real numbers. Then we discovered to our dismay that indeed there are lots of other properties which so far they've not been able to tell us about. And then we've sort of moved on a bit to say, okay, we may not know much about individual numbers, Let's try to make sense of the set of numbers which have a given Diophantine property. So this theorem is an example of that. It says the set of numbers which are approximable by the function psi has this zero one property. The previous one which said that the set of badly approximable numbers can be characterized by having bounded partial equations is another example and so on and so forth. So now uh, what I'm going to try to do is try to tie up 
the strands of my preamble and the introduction. The preamble was about uh, gases and uh, chaotic systems and space average and time average. And then I completely changed track to try to understand what real numbers look like. So let's try to uh, weave these two strands together and see if we can come up with a pattern that is to our liking. All right. Okay, so this brings me to the study of what is uh, what are called dynamical systems. Right? So basically, the, the thing that I'm going to try to do is convince you that an arithmetic property like a continued fraction expansion or uh, being badly approximable or having Kinchin's theorem, these properties can in many ways, in many cases, be expressed in terms of the motion of some particle on some nice object, right? So in terms of a dynamical system. So this is what is going to connect the two parts of the top, all right? So what is a dynamical system? So as usual, one uh, proceeds by example. So there's no definition. It's going to be uh, our familiar old saying that uh, if it looks like a dynamical system and smells like a dynamical system, then it is a dynamical system, okay? So let's just see what that means. Here's an example. So take the torus, okay? The quotient of the real line by the integers. Everyone happy with taking the quotient of the real line by the integers? All right, so uh, I'm taking that to be a yes, but feel free to interrupt me. So certainly uh, when I was uh, young and encountered the quotient topology, initially it was a little disconcerting, but uh, you know, youngsters these days are all very smart. So this is the quotient of the real line by the integers. It's the torus, it's a compact topological space. And on this space, I'm going to introduce a map, okay? This map is called a times two map. Okay, and it's very simple. You take a point X on the torus, you take a real number between zero and one, you multiply it by two and go mod one. That's it, All right? So this is uh, an example of a dynamical system. And uh, what, I, what do I want to do with it, right? I want, what I want to do with it is very simple. I want to do things like, uh, iterate it many times and try to see what happens. I just want to play with it, right? So iterating maps like this many times and trying to see what happens is uh, what people call a topological dynamics, okay? And uh, there's another kind of dynamics, which is what erotic theory comprises, which is trying to see how uh, objects like Lebesgue measure the thing that we talked about a little while ago, how measures interact with dynamical system, with maps like this, right? So, uh, you know, does the map leave a measure invariant? Do the map and the measure talk to each other? Can they sense each other's presence or not? These are the main questions of ergodic theory. And uh, a more complicated example, which is, something that will come up is, uh, it's a more complicated example of the torus, okay? So uh, like I took the quotient of the real line by the integers, which means that I took uh, the interval zero one, I wrapped it around and kept going, right? That's what it is. I can, it turns out, right? It turns out. I can do the same thing with the group of two by two matrices whose entries are real numbers. And these matrices have the additional constraint that the determinant is one, okay? So this is a group which we call SL2R. And in this group, I could look at the subgroup of matrices whose entries are integers, all right? 
and uh, form the same quotient. So this is some kind of matrix analog of the torus. Right? And on this space, I can introduce a map which is in very similar to this times two map. And this map takes, it's a, it's a matrix, it's a matrix group of the special linear group, and it acts on this coset space by left multiplication, all right? So this is a coset space. A point in the space is just a matrix little g in SL2R uh, times SL2Z, that's the coset. All I'm doing is multiplying little g by this diagonal matrix. Now, this, this torus here is a compact uh, object. This space here, this uh, quotient of the special linear group by its integer points is not unfortunately a compact space. However, it's uh, the next best thing one can hope for, namely, it turns out to have a finite, uh, a natural finite measure. Okay, so in, it's a problem. It can be made into a, in a natural way. It can be made into a probability space. All right. So if you've not seen this kind of thing before, don't worry about it. Think about it as a higher dimensional non-abelian analog of the torus, which is not compact, but uh, it's, uh, you know, it's not very big, right? It's compactness is uh, something which is, you know, it's, it's a small condition. So this, this object, this quotient, similarly is, is small enough that one can handle it, all right? So it's not very big, okay? All right, so uh, this flow, is what one calls the geodesic flow on the modular surface. Right? So this is a complicated sounding bullet point, and I will try to explain using a picture. Some of us have seen this picture, some of us have, haven't. It doesn't matter, let me try to explain it. Right, so, um, this picture is a picture in the upper half plane, uh, which is a model of uh, negatively curved space, right? So let's not worry too much about negatively curved space. Let me try to explain this in the following way. Now, the one way of uh, kind of recognizing the torus, right? The quotient of R by Z is to say, that if I take the unit interval zero one, I can translate the unit interval zero one and cover the whole line, right? So in other words, this closed interval uh, shifts and covers the line, it designates the line. Similarly, if I take the torus in two dimensions, right? So I take the unit square, I can tile the plane using translates of the unit square in such a way that uh, the translates uh, don't overlap much, right? At the most, they might overlap at the boundary and I can try to do something, okay? So this is another way of saying that the quotient uh, is the torus, all right? So this object, this, this uh, unit interval or the square uh, has a name in mathematics, it's called the fundamental domain, okay? So uh, objects like the integers Z or Z2 in R2 or SL to Z and SL to R, these objects are called lattices, all right? And they're characterized by having a suitable fundamental domain with which you can tile in an efficient manner, okay? So there are two conditions that are needed. The tile must not be very large. It must have finite volume. Uh, and the subgroup must be discrete, all right? So like Z is an R. So this picture here is just a picture of a tiling for this 
group SL2Z, all right? So uh, if you know a little bit about hyperbolic geometry, you would have seen this picture and I could have explained also how it is that this ties. But for now, let's just uh, try to work by analogy. So like we saw in Z2 tiles R2, namely the fundamental domain tiles R2, this uh, object here, which I mean intend to be actually be a triangle with one vertex at infinity, this uh, is a finite area tile for the upper half plane by SL2Z, okay? So it's just a pictorial representation of what the quotient of SL2Z, of SL2R by SL2Z should look like. One pictorial representation. <coughs> Pardon me. Can I ask how much time I have left? Uh, 10 minutes? Uh, maybe around 10, yeah, maybe 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay. I'll try to wrap this up. Right? Yeah. So uh, let me try to uh, explain what this has to do with Diophantine approximation. So what this has to do is, uh, Basically, you can take uh, an arithmetic or Diophantine property of a real number and model it on the space SL to R factor SL to Z, right? You can do it, in fact, you can do it in two different ways at least, both of which are really beautiful, right? So this story, I will tell you some other time if you'll be kind enough to have me. But this continued fraction expansion that we started off with that admits uh, <clears throat> that comes with a dynamical system, which was uh, first invented or discovered, depending on how you think about these things, by Gauss. All right, and this dynamical system called the Gauss map can be uh, pictorially visualized in this upper half uh, plane. But today I'm going to talk about a slightly different way of uh, bringing out the arithmetic from the ergodic theory. And to do that, I'm going to identify the quotient of SL to R by SL to Z with the space of all lattices in R2, okay? So what, is it, what does it mean, right? So let's look at the plane R2. And uh, we all know, we just saw that one example of a lattice is Z2, okay? Now, uh, there are many other lattices, right? So for example, I could take a one, two by any one, two by two matrix and uh, multiply each vector in Z2 with this two by two matrix. So for example, this could be just a rotation of Z2. It could be a shear of Z2. Right, it could be some combination of these. This will give me a new lattice, will give me a new tiling of the plane. Okay. If I insist that the new tiling should also have the same property which distinguishes Z2, namely that its fundamental domain has area one, then this, this, the collection, the right fancy word is modulized with the collection of all such unimodular lattices, turns out, can be identified with this quotient simply by the orbit stabilizer theorem of group theory. Because this SN to R acts on all lattices and you can check it acts transitively and the stabilizer of the distinguished lattice Z2 is exactly SL to Z. And there's nothing special about two, so you can make this statement. N plus one, all right? And now uh, let me end with uh, how to study uh, Diophantine properties using the space. What you do is you take a real number X and embed it in the top right corner of a triangular matrix. So let's assume that we're working in SL2, right? So this is a real number. And this is a two by two matrix, which is one X zero one, all right? Simple. Now this matrix, when I apply it to 
uh, the standard lattice Z2 gives me a point in this quotient, namely this quotient, which is SL2 R factor SN to Z, we just discussed is the space of all lattices. In this space, I am identifying a distinguished lattice. The distinguished lattice is uh, has been produced from this real number in the following simple fashion. You take the real number, you plonk it in the upper right corner of a two by two matrix, take this two by two matrix and multiply it with every vector in Z2 to produce a new lattice, which is a point in this space. And it turns out that by moving this point around by, let me just go back, by this guy, this, make, this diagonal matrix, you can read off, and this is something which at first sight is a bit perplexing. You can take this new lattice, move it around this space, and read off the properties of X using the behavior of this orbit. Okay, so for example, it's a famous result of uh, Dani of SG Dani. That remember these badly approximable numbers that we uh, encountered. It turns out that you can give uh, another characterization of these. Namely, a number is badly approximable if and only if, when you look at the orbit of the corresponding lattice on the space, it's bounded. Okay. All right. So it this this uh, flow it, it's actually very chaotic. It goes all over the space. But if you start off with a badly approximable number, then it's not allowed to proceed beyond a certain point, and vice versa. Okay, so this characterization of Dani is uh, very uh, interesting because it allows X to not only be a number, but to be a higher dimensional object. Okay, so this in some sense, what I'm trying to uh, pitch to you is ergodic theory as a weak substitution for the continued fractional algorithm in higher dimensions. Okay. There's no good high, uh, continued fraction algorithm in high dimensions. Um, and what we are trying to study, which is chaotic motions on objects such as this quotient, serves as a weak substitute. Sometimes it's strong enough to say a really interesting thing, sometimes not. So let me end by going full circle. Right? So, what can I say about the cube root of two? Uh, sadly, not much. Okay. So last year, the Abel Prize, which is a very important prize, uh, went to uh, two uh, great mathematicians, uh, Hilaire Furstenberg and Gregory Margulis, both of whom uh, work in this area and have made uh, you know, many seminal contributions. In particular, Furstenberg has reformulated the property of the cube root of two being not badly approximable in terms of a precise conjecture involving uh, some objects in this space of lattices. And all of us everywhere have since, uh, since Wustenberg did this, all of us everywhere have been uh, running around trying to get our heads around it, but uh, unfortunately, no one has succeeded. Maybe uh, the person who succeeds is in the audience. All right, so I'll stop here. Thank you. All right. So thank you, Anis. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, so is there any question? Yeah, so I have a quick question. So, so what was the last thing you talked about? I could not uh, follow it properly. So what the students would try some uh, conjecture, that's what you said. Yeah, there is a famous conjecture of Furstenberg, yeah. which says that uh, the cube that, root of two is well approximable, as if and only if a certain lattice cooked up from the cube root of two 
uh, has a divergent orbit in the space of that. I see. So is it the famous uh, cross two, cross three conjecture? No, it's not, right? It's not. Cross it's related to it, but it's not. It's okay. a different conjecture of this thing, right? I see. Uh, which is also very much. Uh, so, so what is this uh, cross two, cross three conjecture? Okay. okay, so the times to times conjecture is also very easy to state. Remember, I uh, let me just go back to sharing my screen. So remember, I uh, went, I started with this example of a dynamical system, which is simply multiplication by two on the circle, circle right? All right, so there's nothing special about two. You can multiply by three as well, or five or seven, or anything that you please. Now it turns out that if you multiply by an individual number, like two or three, then the dynamics of this map is easy to understand. Basically, it turns out that this is what one calls a symbolic system. It's something called a Bernoulli shift. It's like the continued fraction expansion. So the, the dynamics can be ex ex explained in terms of uh, shifting of an alphabet. And it's very easy to see it because basically it, it just boils down to expressing real numbers in base two or base three. Okay. okay. So this was, uh, this is fine. It's very good. So Fustenberg's times two times three conjecture, which is open since uh, 1967, is a statement that the dynamics, the ergodic theory of times two and times three are really very different, okay? So they're very different objects. They're what are called disjoint. So what the precise conjecture says that if you have a measure on the circle, which is ergodic and invariant under both times two and times three, then it must be the Lebesgue measure on the circle, or it must be a measure supported on a finite set of rational points. This is the conjecture. It's uh, really very, very easy to state, but it seems to be uh, out of reach. I mean, there have been some uh, good, uh, advances, for example, if you assume positive entropy for one of the measures, then you can classify all the measures. And uh, a more sophisticated analog of this positive entropy is what uh, was Linden Strauss's uh, Fields Medal work. But the fact of the matter remains that if you take very simple questions like times two times three or is the cube root of two well approximable, then uh, we have no idea what to do yet. So there seems to be some very fundamental issues needing new ideas. Okay. Okay, so any more questions uh, from the students or colleagues, anyone? Sir, I have a couple of questions. Yes, and, please. Uh, okay, yeah, go ahead. Like uh, say something before uh, the questions. So yeah. um, correct me if I'm wrong. So if you want to look at uh, the asymptotic frequency of an integer in a continued fraction of an irrational yes. uh, between zero and one, then you can do so using, uh, th this is another remarkable application of ergodic theory. You can do that's so right, using- That's right, you can do the law of large numbers. Yes. Yeah, okay. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Yeah, this is something I wanted to add. And uh, so um, the questions I have are, um, so I have seen in a lot of talks that uh, people talk about billiard problems. Yes. Uh, like they start with a ball and the ball keeps on bouncing infinitely often. And we have to answer the question, what is the path traced by the ball? So yes. how do we uh, really approach these uh, questions? This is slightly different from... Uh, if I take a ray and just uh, travel along the torus. I that's think right, like, that's right, that's yeah. right. Okay. All right, so, so I, I'll answer that question. What's the next one? 
Um, this answer is going to be a bit long. So if the next okay. one is short, then I'll take that first. Okay. Uh, I am still formulating my next question. So would you please? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So uh, yes, uh, that is very true. It's a very good remark by Viswadeep and a good question. So uh, indeed, uh, billiard dynamics is a subject which has been around for a long time, at least since, uh, you know, Kolmogorov's time. And uh, indeed, it's true that uh, we don't have uh, a very good understanding of what's going on, okay? So this, the, the, the subject that I, was trying to describe to you goes by the name homogeneous dynamics because the spaces that we consider, which are these quotients, are sometimes called homogeneous spaces on account of the fact that uh, locally, when you live on these spaces, uh, you tend to see the same surrounding. There is uh, another. Uh, so in, in this uh, subject of homogeneous dynamics, there were some landmark conjectures due to Raghunathan and Dani, which were formulated in the early 1980s and were resolved uh, by Marina Ratner in a series of famous works in the 90s. Okay, And these and conjectures uh, are very uh, striking because they say that even though these uh, systems are very complicated and chaotic, their dynamics can be algebraically described, okay? So you can describe the orbits and the ergodic measures using algebraic data. This is a mind-blowing thing if you first encounter it because it, it's very, it means that these systems are very rigid, right? So there are only five or six possible outcomes for what an orbit could be. And this kind of behavior is dramatically at odds from normal ergodic systems. Around the early 2000s, maybe a little earlier, uh, there was a movement to replicate this kind of rigidity in a slightly different setting related to billiards. Right? And this setting is what is called the modulized space of flat surfaces. Okay? So I'm not going to describe what they are and what it is, but what I'm going to say is, uh, so this uh, SL2R factor SL2Z you can view it as the modulized space of a flat two tora. Okay? If you know what this is, it's fine. If you don't, it doesn't matter. What's important is there's another very interesting uh, space whose points are uh, interesting objects. And the space also admits an action by this two by two matrix group SL2R. Okay? And it's a very complicated action. And it tells you a fair bit about the billiard flow. Right? So this is what the analogy is. And around the year, uh, around in, starting from the early 2000s, there was a movement led by Alex Eskin of the University of Chicago and by joined by many famous, uh, other famous people to try and prove some rigidity statements like the Dali Raghunathan conjectures in the setting of these billiards. Okay, so this area, which is a very exciting area also, is very much still ongoing. And uh, the highlight of it was, of course, the breakthrough work of Eskin and Mirza Khan, who proved a special case of these conjectures analogous conjectures to Ratner's conjectures in the setting of uh, the so-called uh, Teichmuller dynamics or you know, dynamics on the modelized space of flat surfaces. So a good place to read about uh, the analogy between homogeneous dynamics and this uh, 
Dijkmuller staff is uh, a survey of uh, Anton Zorich. So he has a very long survey, with beautifully written. It needs a little bit of background, but once you have it, it's uh, worth the read. And uh, before I forget, let me just uh, provide a brief um, advertisement. So here we run a random geometry colloquium on Mondays. And on the 29th of November, exactly a month from now, we have uh, Simeon Philip from the University of Chicago, who's one of the recent stars in this billiard flow business speaking. So you're very welcome to come and listen. All right, so that's my spiel about billiards. What's the next question? Okay, I um, wanted to ask something about the magic wand problem if... Uh, yes, I, this is I, what I, the magic wand problem is. Okay. This, uh, you know, it's... Let me give you an example of why someone would call it magic. Take this uh, geodesic flow that I described, namely take the diagonal matrix e to the t, e to the minus t, and act on the quotient SL to R factor SL to Z. Okay. What are the possibilities for orbits? And the answer is that there pretty much anything that you want that you can imagine is possible. For example, we encountered the notion of fractional house of dimension early in the talk. So uh, you can give me any number between zero and one or one and two. And I can, using tools from dynamics, construct an orbit of this flow whose Half star dimension is the number that you gave it. So there are uncountably many possibilities of orbits. Everything is very chaotic. Now replace this diagonal matrix by an upper triangular matrix. And the answer is that there are only two possibilities for orbits. Every orbit has to be one of two kinds. It either has to distribute itself in a uniform fashion throughout the space, or it has to be periodic. It has to wind up and then keep winding. That's it. So the can you can you see sense the difference in dynamics? So one one dynamics offers you an uncountable zoo of complications. The other one has two. Right. So this two thing, this two is the Raghunathan Dani Ratner scenario, which is that unipotent, these matrices which have uh, one to the diagonal and an upper triangle are called unipotent. Dynamics of these guys is rigid, it's algebraic, and has very few options for orbit closures, which can be explicitly described. So that is magic, right? That's absolutely mind-blowing magic. And it has amazing uh, corollary. So this kind of thing, and you can apply it to very strange situations and get very striking results, um, which I didn't speak about today, but perhaps another day. In the context of flat surfaces, Eskin and Mirza Khani proved exactly something like this for the SL2 R action on the moduli space of flat surfaces. And again, because of the, you know, it's such a stark, the possibilities are endless and the conclusion is, uh, you know, so beautiful and so concise that this came to be known as the magic wand theorem. So you should think about it as uh, a magic one theorem because it takes the absolute cornucopia of options and compresses it and gives you like three, three options. A very complicated system, only three outcomes possible. That's magic, as far as I'm concerned, that's as close to magic as you can get. 
Okay. So that's, that's a very interesting and uh, illuminating uh, problem. So I think, uh, yeah, so uh, I hope uh, there is, uh, I, I don't know, I mean, is there any more questions? Uh, so people can of course ask, uh, uh, because uh, in in-person talks, uh, we can ask during tea breaks, but here there is no tea break. Yes, there's no tea break. This is really a disaster yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, otherwise uh, it gives us nice uh, time for interaction over uh, some tea and snacks. But yeah, let me just say that uh, I'm yeah. always uh, happy to answer emails. Right? So yeah, you can, so, you can feel free to email me and I will answer. Yeah, absolutely. So I think thank you very much, Anish, for this wonderful talk. Thank you for this invitation. Yeah, so we also Thank have customary mug as a gift to give to the speakers. So we are unable next to- Next time, next time. Next time, yeah, or maybe uh, your visit is due here. So when you come, you, you two cups. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. I can okay. drink coffee and tea together. All right, yeah. thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so let's virtually thank Anish. So I thank here. Uh, yeah, so. Let's clap uh, virtually and uh, manu, I mean, in person, whatever way people want to thank you. But the punchline is that we thank you very much for this wonderful talk. It's a pleasure. And, thank you for it. And we nice have talk. to yeah. see you in person at Isar Mohali campus on some fine day. I'd love to visit and I will as soon as circumstances. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. So I'm closing the meeting now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.